We had the launch, the debut episode of This Was Extreme Today with Josh Chernoff, the Blue Meanie, and Joel Gertner. And an ad-free show style, they are here the day of the release for all of you, my push and top guys, so that we can do a Q&A with them for the next hour or so. Uh, if you guys have questions, same rules as we've always done, go ahead and put that in the chat and I will rotate around and make sure that we have all of your questions answered, uh, but excited to have them. So we have Josh Chernoff with us again from Mind of the Meanie. You may have seen him on Fight TV. He's helped us with StarCast and the guys that need no introduction the Blue Meanie and Joel Gertner are here as well. So we're going to go ahead and uh, you guys have anything to say before we kick this off? Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, this is a, a pleasure. Uh, I love the crew at Ad Free Shows and uh, it's it's cool to be uh, part of the uh, Ad, Free Sh Ad, Ad Free Show. Sorry, first day with the new math. Still kind of hungover. Uh, shows experience. Uh, love Conrad. Love the Podfather. And uh, I'm I'm happy to have these two guys along with me by my side to uh, in this new venture. Yeah, no, that's awesome, and I know everyone's been looking forward to here at Ad Free Shows for you know towards the show, and have been looking forward to this. So the big drop today to start 2021 in an extreme way is pretty cool. So we're glad to have you, Joel. Any any few words before we kick it off and start handing over to the guys for questions. Just a few, because I concur wholeheartedly with everything Meany said. I just want to say that out of everything that I've done related to professional wrestling in the year 2021, this has to be, above all of it, absolutely the most recent. Uh, good well stuff. Well said. All right. Well, let's jump into it. We have a, a question from Michael McClanahan. Michael, you're on with the crew. What do you have uh, for the guys here tonight? Good evening, everyone. First, Happy New Year, and I really enjoyed listening to today's podcast. I thought it was excellent. My question is for each of the three hosts. I was just wondering, is there a topic or a particular topic that each one of you is looking forward to covering as you do more episodes of the show? Is there like a singular topic that you're each kind of looking forward to getting to dive into in a little bit more depth? Uh. For me personally, uh, to me, the cool thing about ECW was the music. Uh, so I would love to maybe do an episode diving into the music of ECW, whether it's talking about the, the influence of ECW with music or bring on, we could, you know, I have access to Harry Slash who did all the original themes for and, ECW. And he the did the Sabu theme, all the, the total elimination theme. We can dive into what his mindset was for each song or the inspiration and you know anything anything and we, we could cover that's the beauty of this thing we could literally cover everything but i'm such a music mark and uh i know when it came to ecw i think the music was just as important to the show and you know you know one week one week they would play an allison chain song for like a sabu video I'm like, oh my God, there's a new Alice in Chains album. And I would I finish watching the show and run down and go buy the album. So yeah, if, it, if, if there's one topic I hope we uh, cover down the line, it, it's definitely ECW and it's, it's relationship with music. Joe. You know, I, I'd have to say as a performer, um, there are just some honors, just some absolute blessings. Like, you know, if you're, for example, Robin Williams, and you get to devote some time or, or donate some of your energy to a USO tour. You know, sometimes it's performers um, showing respect for the services of others. Um, what I would want to do is maybe, I don't know if we could get an entire episode or it would have to be more like half an episode, but if we could donate some time to the one woman who didn't have the same opportunity, let's say, as a Robin Williams, the USO tour and that kind of thing. But what she did do in South Carolina before one of our house shows one night is she entertained all of the boys by smoking a cigarette with her vagina. And I think if we could give at least 20 minutes of time to that, that would be something that I would be on board with. Meanie, don't act like you aren't there. I, uh, 
<laughs> well, my answer quickly changed to that. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, otherwise, I think for for me, it I'm. Be, it would have to be half that, half travel odd stories. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those kind of, from what I understand, just kind of blend. Um, yeah. But similar themes. Uh, for me, I'm looking forward to uh, an opportunity, hopefully, that we'll have to go with individual people and their journey. So for me, I, it would actually be both Meanie and Joel to be able to do episodes on each of them uh, as kind of like the, the first in line to ask questions. Cause like you don't get to do that as just a wrestling fan. You don't get to, you know, imagine you go up to the blue Meanie or Joel Gertner, uh, you know, outside an arena and just, Hey, can I ask you a question for two hours about your entire career and journey to get to this point? So I think it would be, a lot of fun to be able to do that and, and go right to the source. Also, I would say uh, any like feuds, like a, a dissecting uh, Taz and Sabu or uh, Tommy Dreamer and Raven, some of like the real, um, you know, the well-known feuds from ECW history would be really cool to kind of uh, do some stuff like that. Yeah, especially if we did it like an episode on Cronus, you know, I could just bring I'm still friends with his son, Gage. We could bring his son on. and Yeah, and that's something, too, that we've talked about, you know, and you mentioned it a little bit with Harry Slash. Like, we would love the opportunity. So, like, this is our base, you know, the three of us here for me to kind of, uh, you know, direct traffic with Meanie and Joel, but to then be able to bring a fourth person in um, to discuss, even if it's not for a full episode, but to discuss uh, a specific topic um, and you know, what stories maybe they have with Meany and Joel. So like, that's something, you know, you're talking about Cronus's son, or there's so many people, um, that are associated with people who came through ECW. So I think that would be a lot of fun to do. Yeah. There's a lot of unsung heroes that were never in front of the camera that, you know, I would love to, or it, people in front of the camera, like, you know, the referees, you know, uh, you know, mo the most impartial guys, if you want to get an impartial story. You know, go to John Finnegar and Jim John, uh, Jim Molino, and they had no politics and anything, and they could just give you the straight fucking shoot, you know. And uh, you know, they're both brutally honest. So, you know, I would love to bring on the refs. I'd love, I would love to bring on everybody behind the scenes. Shit, we'll do an episode dedicated to the fans. He said, "I'll be. We'll bring on Hat Guy. We could do whatever, <laughs> you know, if we can find Hat Guy." Uh, but uh, yeah, it's hanging out somewhere in uh, WWWWA or whatever the hell with Dino Santa. I'm Dino Santa, baby. Uh, the house was like they pay on the fruit basket. Yeah, <laughs> if you're if you're lucky. I think he paid Stevie in the fruit basket once. <laughs> uh, Stevie, the house was a little light. Uh, here's some fruit. <laughs> He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Michael, was, uh, was that what you were looking for there? Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you so much. And again, big fan yeah. of the podcast, and I think you guys all did an excellent job. Well, thank you awesome. so much. Thank you. I can't believe already in the first five or ten minutes we've divulged that the Fruit League was the developmental for hot dog and a handshake and turkey <laughs> and tap water. But what, what's, what's, what's left? What are we going to do with the rest of our time? Uh, well... Well, listen, we got plenty of questions queued up here, so <laughs> let's head over to Carl Mandick. Yes, that's his name. Carl, you have a question for the guys. Hey, guys, what's going on? Uh, Josh, really love what you just said right there. Would love to hear more about the Raven and Tommy uh, few diving deep into that. Uh, reasons why I'm single, number two. I know it was nine years ago this week that uh, Tommy Dreamer's last match in WWE slash ECW, blah, whatever that formation was, was actually this week. So that uh, that brought up, I was watching a whole bunch of Dreamer and Raven and Beulah and that. So Josh, great call on that. Meaning I am still working as hard as I can to get R.L. Stein so you can do the voiceovers for Raven for an audible version of Goosebumps of, <laughs> of just doors opening and, and things that go bump in the night. So I'm still working very hard on that. Very cool. My question is this. Um, can, especially going to Joel and to, and to Blue Meanie, can you talk about the speech that was made going into the 1997 barely legal pay-per-view? Um, it, was that dramatized or was that overdone by the production crew of Beyond the Mat? Or was that something that was different and or 
um, something that that Paul Heyman did that was out of out of his way to to really let you know you've been to the dance and even Meany, you referenced it on on episode one um you know kind of saying we were ready as we never were type of thing <laughs> um so if you can comment on on yeah i guess kind of a two part there the speech itself and the beyond the mac crew being there and their impact and or influence of how we remember barely legal uh that, that the speech was was what it was there wasn't any special editing or whatever to make it you know because you know when you watch you know these reality shows you you know they can edit any and edit footage to make it look any certain way you know but uh that speech was pretty dead on as as he said it and uh it wasn't out of character for paul to have a pre-show speech or a post-show speech or just like a meeting you know uh like I said, uh, I think I said, I'm pretty sure I said this in the, uh, that was extreme that, uh, there's a couple meetings leading up to the pay-per-view mm-hmm. to smarten us up. How, uh, you know, payment was going to work and all this and that and the other thing. But yeah, we, we had plenty of like pre-show speech and post-show speeches that were not much different from what he did in beyond the mat. And, uh, the, the beyond the Mac crew were good because, yeah, we're good because you didn't even really notice they were there. You know, they were so, you know, out of the way and filming and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, you know, that Paul, that the Paul speech as it was as, as authentic as when he said it, they didn't spice it up or do anything else, you know, to uh, enhance it or anyway. Gotcha. And, and Joel kind of the same thing. Yeah. I, I just wondered if that left a tangible, kind of uh reaction to you it did um like meanie said paul gave a speech to the best of my recollection pretty much every three weeks at the the, before every ecw arena show he would give us a speech and, and it was not to say that it wasn't usually a pep talk because it kind of was, but it was also a way of, so that you're not hearing it through the grapevine. It was mm-hmm. kind of official minutes and memos where you were hearing straight from the horse's mouth, straight from the office, everything that was going on that you needed to know about all of the developments in the last three weeks in ECW behind the scenes. So we would get a speech like that for every ECW arena show, but I think this one happened to be the one that was of the most Wagnerian proportions. Um, You had the camera crew there. Uh, It was happening at that pivotal moment in time. It wasn't just before any show. It was before the first pay-per-view. And because of that, it stands out. I I think the best way to maybe put it in perspective is, you know, the football coach is going to give his team a speech before every game. But the speech that we got before Barely Legal was one of cinematic. It was almost like, I think I might have said when we did the podcast, like Major League when he gives the speech. (laughs) Or kind of like in Rudy, where, you know, you're five foot nothing, a hundred and nothing. Like that kind of, it was, we knew it was a moment and we knew it was bigger than the usual. and, And that made sense because it needed to be. The time called for it. It was it was kind of like this speech in uh, Animal House when uh, John Belushi goes, "Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor?" <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I really, I really thank you guys for going into the nuances, and I really love the detail that you guys did on the podcast. For those that haven't listened, uh, especially little little things like the Extreme Fighting League and differentiating that between ECW and the struggles to get onto pay per view. Those little details that you guys threw in there, uh, loved it as a fan, and really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to be on here today and uh, a very uh, prosperous twenty twenty one to all you guys. Thank you, Carl. You too. Thanks for the love. And uh, to add to that real quick, it's just, that's why I love doing the show with Joel because uh, he'll say something that jars a memory loose in my head and maybe vice versa to where like, if it was just me talking about the show, 
I could probably be missing like a small little piece of the detail that Joel goes, Oh, and that's when so-and-so did such and such. And I go, that's right. You know, that kind of stuff. So I like the, uh, the dynamic of that between, you know, Josh coming up with the, doing the research and asking us sort of questions and us bouncing uh, memories off each other. Well, that's, you know, that's something that was so cool too, is you said doing the research, but being able to go back and watch it um, and know that I was going to be able to ask some questions about what I was watching. Uh, but then also doing the, you know, I figure, Hey, it's ad free shows. How can you not go to Meltzer and see, you know, <laughs> what he had to say? Um, he was a, he's a big fan. And uh, no, he, he, uh, you know, but looking at that and you're, that's another side of what the fan saw. So it's the product itself that the fans watched that I remember watching live. And then it's, you know, the observer and say, okay, well, here's the dirt. Here's the behind the scenes aspect in Meltzer's opinion. And then on top of that, the two of you get to go, okay, well, here's what, you know, what none of you saw. Here's what, or here's what really happened. Here's what you thought you saw, but this was the, the truth that we talked about a little bit with Rob Van Dam and uh, whether or not he was actually upset about, you know, like, and all that. So, um, that well, for me the, one so fact cool. that, the one fact I like that you brought up, uh, Josh, is when he's like, uh, he was surprised that JT Smith got the uh, applause he did. Yeah. And me being a former, I used to sit in that crowd before I became a wrestler. I was going to the shows. I knew the mindset of that crowd. Maybe that's why right. I think it was easier for me to work accordingly. He worked to my audience, but I knew why JT Smith got a round of applause because they knew he was one of the founding members of ECW. And this was like a nod to the past. And that's one of the things that I think that's so cool about this show, not to sell it to you guys. Cause it's free and you know, here I have it. but one <laughs> of the we're, things we're I think horrible salesman. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible at it. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I thought was so cool is, you know, let's say you're, you're not really an ECW fan and you read the observer and I don't mean, I'm not burying, Dave or anything. I'm just saying, you know, that was his, he was surprised and that's fair. That's okay. But if you don't really know it, now you walk away with kind of his opinion becoming your opinion. You know, we all tend to do that when we'll read somebody that we trust, you know, their opinion. And it's nice to be able to have you go in there and go like, I don't know what he's talking about. You know, he was, he was over with that crowd. There was no surprise whatsoever. So again, for me, that's just kind of cool to be able to go back and, and, dissect those pieces and just for the record i just hot boxed myself it's horrible in here yikes <laughs> I, uh, I i've got i've i've got my roadcaster pro here meanie <laughs> so <laughs> any anyone who anyone who's familiar with mind of the meanie knows that we occasionally will let let out the occasional <laughs> anyway and right, now we officially have a show. There we go. All <laughs> right. RJ Krasinski, you're up next. Try to follow that, my friend. I, I can. I'm an avid listener of uh, Mind of the Meanie. And, uh, I, uh, so he's heard that a thousand times. And that's just that's just one episode. Yeah. Actually, it's just one segment. Uh, <laughs> um, but thank you. It's it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, uh, bear with me real quick. I. Uh, with everything that's going on in the last, you know, week or so in the business, uh, with the passing of, of Brody, um, it's obvious, it's hit home. Josh and I have talked about it, but how this is more aimed towards, uh, unfortunately I'll get Josh's afterward, but for me and, and Joel, when something like this happens, you know, with the locker room coming together, with the business coming together, do you guys see just wrestling community just becoming a better place in the face of tragedy sometimes, or is it just kind of like the boys and the, and the, and the girls just getting together and um, being one. You want to go first, Joel, or you want me to go first? I mean, Brody, um, Brody was an awesome dude. Um, uh, I only met him a few times. Uh, I have a unique perspective that, uh, when I broke in with Al Snow, one of my classmates was this guy, Rick Matrix, and Rick Matrix wound up training uh, Brody for a little bit. So there, I have that kind of connection, which when I found out Matrix trained him, I was like, holy shit, he trained somebody? Um, 
<laughs> but uh, no, uh, you know, we all, if you've spent any time on the road or in a ring or been lonely in a hotel and just missing home, we can all relate to how that feels. And uh, we have that kinship and that bond. And everybody knows how Brody loved his family and uh, you know, stuff like that. And uh, I, uh, you'll be hard pressed to find anybody who says anything bad about it. I haven't heard of one bad word about the man ever. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it speaks volumes to his character, to who he was, who he is, who he was. And uh, the fact that even AEW went above and beyond with that uh, fitting tribute show, it, it was very touching, very well done. Um, you know, it was crazy. It was because the whole thing was crazy because it was just so sudden and any of us, you know, can look back and go, that could be, that could be me. You know, uh, at one point, you know, I thought it, it, I, it affected me in a way because one time I got sick, um, uh, like March, 2006, I went to bed feeling fantastic. Woke up under degree fever. Well, Short story long or long story short, whichever you prefer. Uh, I've docked a visit to the doc. I thought it was the flu. Turned out to be a bacterial infection in my lung. Uh, I had to get part of my lung removed. So when I heard like I, I, he had a lung issue and it took over really quick, I started having flashbacks to my deal, you know, because I was on the West Coast in Oregon. I was just trying to get back home to Philly. And I'm walking through an airport in Minnesota saying, please don't pass out. Please don't pass out. <laughs> I'll pass out in Philly. I could be in a Philly hospital with my family. I don't want to be stuck that, in, in a Minnesota. Is that when you big dogged uh, Shelton Benjamin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, had a, I, you're, I ran into Shelton Benjamin in the Minneapolis airport when I was really sick. And I, you know, it's easy to think, you know, one of the boys is probably pulled up or something. I probably looked, like I was, I was like a zombie years later. I apologize. I said, dude, you saw me in the airport that time. I was just really sick. I wasn't big league in year or nothing, but, uh, back to Brody. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, that, that story hit me in a different way because I was kind of in that situation. Thankfully I, you know, the doctors, you know, diagnosed me and took care of it and stuff like that. But I, I'm sure like, you know, Joel, who's been on the road, countless times i've been on the road countless times uh, any of the boys who've you know had those you know you've been in a hotel room and your wife's going when you coming home and you know you're trying to do your best to i mean look at a guy like owen hart you know he did everything for his family on the road there he was universally loved still is you know brody was a owen Hart type where he did everything for his family and uh everybody can relate and everybody can respect it yeah, I, I didn't know Brody personally. Um, and after hearing so much about him from all the people who knew and loved him, uh, I wish I did, but I didn't. Um, your question, I'll probably do a terrible job at answering it because it kind of I started thinking about, you know, I, I don't know Brody well enough to, to answer, but I know everybody who's spoken about him loved him so much. He's, he's such a great dude. So because I didn't know him, your question took me in a different kind of, I was pretty young when I was in ECW. I was between the ages of 20 and 25. And when you ask about, you know, loss and death and grievance and mourning and the wrestling community, one thing it made me think about is when I was in my early to mid 20s, I had probably been to more work colleague related funerals than most people go to in their entire lives. Um, there, there was just a lot of loss. Um, as a community, the one thing that you can do, and I think it's, it's up to all of us to live up to it. It's an obligation when you're carrying the load and moving on and those that you've loved have left, but you're still here. I think what you need to do is remember that just because you have a, a, a trinket, a, a, a fleet of fame in the, pro look, Tom Cruise doesn't have the right to be a trash person. 
And if Tom Cruise doesn't have the right to be a trash person, nobody on earth does. And nobody in the professional wrestling business does. When somebody like Brody Lee leaves this planet, don't just talk about how good he was, but let your actions speak the same way as your words do and let him continue to live through you and everything that you've admired about him, make sure that you give and pass that on to others who are well-deserving. And, and Josh, obviously we, for anybody that listens to Mind of the Meanie, you know, you have the roadcaster there with, like I said, probably about a thousand of Meanie passing gas. Um, is there room for, for Joel on there? Not his passing gas, but maybe a well, 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 or something. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure with me, possibly between the two of them passing gas, we'll probably shake Philadelphia off the, uh, off the map. But um, is there room for, for Mr. Gertner there with the well, well, well? Let me put it this way. If Joel Gertner was willing to bequeath a well, well, well to me and my roadcaster, I would. He didn't it. say I should queef it. He said I should fart it. <clears throat> oh, well, it all sounds the same when <laughs> it's coming from, you know. Uh, no, I think, uh, yeah, there absolutely is space for his, uh, <laughs> que- his queefing and his well, well, well. That's the genuine, genuine article in the fart, by the way, folks. Don't be, uh, don't be. Fooled. Yeah, that's it. That's what uh, we in the business call a shoot fart. Yeah. Um, it's not a working fart. It's almost <laughs> it's, a short uh, fart. But, so, yeah, no. A limited number of participants solely from the pro wrestling industry, by the way. So nobody that matters in case anything bad, but just a few people within pro wrestling have volunteered to take the stud meanie vaccine, which is me and meanie both simultaneously farting into a vial. And believe me, that one will be distributed and disseminated properly and it will be nothing to sneeze or fart at wow i think the distributed uh, at the travel lodge at the travel lodge the cylinder of sin the container will not be the only vile thing in that concoction but uh yeah no we'll make we'll make room for a little well 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 rj don't you worry well whoever's up next follow that you said cock All right. Well, that's a fun (laughs) transition over to Anthony Pyers. What do you have for the boys now? First of all, happy new year to the AFS family. Uh, Joel, uh, Josh, I've been a fan of yours since the after chat days. And I discovered Jen. uh, I told you I had a fan. You had a fan. Yes. Yes. I want to thank you. But uh, to, I don't really, I don't really so much just have a question, but to Joel and the meanie, um, my, my cousin reached out to me because he knew I was a nutty wrestling fan. And he told me I had to watch this ECW. And I swear to God, right hand of God, our two favorite acts were the blue world order and Joel and his limericks. My God, you guys helped bring a family, believe it or not, closer together. So without, I don't want to take up time from anybody else, but I want to thank all three of you for a enriching my life and b entertaining me so much and especially in the case of joel my my cousin and i always begin conversations with well 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 so that's the legacy if that's a a little legacy you leave behind that's all i've got i want to make sure everybody gets a shot thank all thank you to all three of you for what you've done for me in the last God almighty, 24, 25 years. Thank oh, you, thank Anthony, you. for what you've now done for me and Mimi and all of us in ECW because God bless you all. To be honestly considered family entertainment, <laughs> you have to impact at least two families. So there's a plurality. <laughs> and now we understand that we impacted at least both the Manson family and the Pyers family. So <laughs> my cousin, my cousin you. and I are best friends because of the two of you. Awesome. So thank you. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, without the fans, there's no reason for us to be out there. So, and I yeah. like you too, Josh. So, Hey, no, I'm you referred to yourself as a fan of mine that made my entire night. So thank you. 
God bless. I need a blessing. Josh, oh, these checks that you send out in the mail for people to say that kind of nice stuff, they're all going to go through, right? Yeah, I actually We're PayPal'd not have to do half an episode of them. on bounce checks, right? No, uh, well, I'm sure at some point someone's going to want an episode on bounce checks, but I don't think they're coming from me. So that was a Paul Heyman reference <laughs> uh, for those who didn't get the. Yeah. Everyone's muted, so I don't know if anyone's laughing. It sounds like when I'm with my friends and I make a joke. <laughs> They're roaring. Don't worry. I think they're smirking. Do you guys? Okay. All right. Well, hey, Anthony, thanks for chiming in. That was awesome. And thank you. Uh, thank, you, let's, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Let's move on to Rob Langston. Rob, you're on with the guys. Hey, guys. Uh, Meany and Gardner, thank you all very much for entertaining me over the years with ECW. I used to go to some of the shows. It was definitely a blast to see you guys live. Um, my question is, do y'all have any good stories on like Rick Rude and Louis Spicoli from back in the day before they left? Uh, real, I got a, one of my favorite, I love Louis Spicoli. I think the whole locker room truly loved Louis, but, uh, we were in Trenton, New Jersey and, uh, I think it was at the Trenton CYO. And I was uh, in the men's room, shocker. And uh, I hear like this stuff. I hear like a, not commotion or whatever. I hear like singing in the locker room. And I come out of the bathroom and I see Louis Piccoli and Beulah McGillicuddy leading the ECW locker room in the, in the singing of Summer Nights from Greece. Doing a well, oh, well, oh, well, oh, who? And Bueller was uh, Livy Newton John, and Spicoli was uh, uh, Travolta. And uh, I was like, it's like, if people saw this, they would be so disappointed, right? Because <laughs> we were like the extreme, crazy, whatever. You know, it's like the time I come back from, uh, you know, doing the YMCA in the ring, and I, I look, I come through the locker room, and there's Shane and Big Dick Dudley doing the YMCA. I'm like, guys we got to be hardcore but uh yeah for uh louis this seeing him and uh Beulah singing summer nights in the locker room was really cool uh rick rude uh he was just so dry with it it's real funny he would just say something and you'd be rolling and he'd deadpan you know and so but there's some chick uh one of uh, the one of the, there was a woman walking by and she was wearing white spandex it's like uh, if that was me, I'd have bacon strips in my underwear or something like this. Yeah, he would just say like something real, real dry and just like we couldn't get away with that, huh? Or but then again, like he would get it. You know, we would do like the pre-show workouts and he would take the guys aside and be like, hey, if anybody tries to get cute in the ring, you could do this, do that, do the other thing. You know, you know, he showed me how to bear hug a guy and break his collarbone with his chin. Yeah, just like crazy stuff. Like, cause he was, he was a legit tough guy. You know, he was known for, uh, to, him and his wife would go to a, a bar and he would have his wife go set the bar and wait for some guy to come over and hit on his wife and then go, what the fuck, man? And like, just try to start a fight with a guy. He just, uh, just for shits and giggles, you know, just, but, uh, rude was awesome, you know, as a, as a, as a locker room presence, he uh, added legitimacy to ECW. Uh, you know, as soon as they said, he said, it's a new year, Shane Douglas, the crowd just fucking went ape shit because they just knew the voice and that guy who battled the ultimate war and all that stuff, you know, he was coming to ECW and, and gave us so much credibility. I didn't get to know Louie too, too well, um, in the storyline parlance, um, he put a cake in my face on my 21st birthday on a Friday night, I believe in, let's call it, I think it was either Glen Olden or Plymouth meeting, Pennsylvania. So I took a 21st birthday cake in the face uh, from Louis Spicoli. That was kind of cool. Um, Rick Rude, man, uh, I think we talk about it on the first podcast, the episode that was just released, but just to be given the spot of going point counterpoint protagonist antagonist with rude and me when it's paul Heyman giving me that chance when paul had managed rude in wcw 
when he was of a similar age. It was just, I mean, you know, I've got a picture from a convention in 91 that I took with Rude when I was like 15 going on 16. It's like 29, 30 years ago to eventually like, you know, eight years later after that picture was taken, whatever, to be able to work with Rude. Um, It's just amazing. And then a story that I never, I don't know if I've ever told this one, but I think there's a 20 year statute of limitations of being able to talk about legends um, um, partaking in um, substances that are essentially basically legal now anyway. But um, we were on the way to go to the studio to record one of those segments where I would try to insult Rude for being a has-been and washed up. And he would say that I was the walrus, cuckoo, cuckoo. And um, we were on our way to record stuff like that in um, in Ron Buffon's parents' basement uh, with the ironing board table and everything. And um, and as we're there, um, I think Debbie uh, Debbie Beaumont maybe was driving, yeah, and Rude was in the passenger seat, and I was in the back seat. And Rude had the sports section of the USA Today. And I noticed in the first part of the ride that, you know, we're talking, we're listening to radio, whatever, everybody's all right. And, and he's kind of looking through and he's reading the sports section of the USA Today. By about half an hour, an hour later, I don't know if you knew that there was an alternate and secondary usage to the USA Today sports section once you're done reading it. But Rick Rude did. He had the forethought that I am pretty sure that he went ahead and rolled the world's largest joint. If he didn't use that sports section, he used something akin to a prosthetic leg. Um, and, And as he would pass it to me in the back, I was actually afraid that I might drop it for the heft that it contained. (laughs) I had never seen anything like this. It, uh, it honestly made, um, it it made Mount Everest look like a peppermint Tic Tac. I mean, it was, it was, it was really beyond the pale. Uh, it was egregious. It was unnecessary. And, uh, and that's what you can do with the USA sports section. Once you're done with it, the more, you know, Ah, just need the NBC banner flying in there. That was that was good shit. Oh, fantastic! All right, let's uh, let's keep it moving. Adam from Bama, he has a question. Adam, what do you got for the guys? Well, I just wanted to say I appreciate y'all taking time out to talk to us and everything. But um, Joel, I was just wondering if you had a favorite promo and introduction that you have, and if you could just give it to us. I think the one that I'm asked for the most. So I guess it's my, like for me, it's like choosing between children, but maybe if you're a parent and a lot of people seem to like one of your kids and not like one of your other kids, then maybe that becomes your favorite kid. I don't know if that's, I'd have to ask Josh maybe or somebody else how that might work, but I don't know. For me, these are my brain children and I can never really decide, but the one that I am asked the most about is, I leave the girlies screaming. They're California dreaming. Cause I'm a pussy licking demon with vanilla flavored semen. And now with hipsters and millennials and whatnot, in the past couple of years when doing indie gigs, if I break that one out of the vault, I usually change vanilla to like dulce de leche or creme brulee or something like that but it still works it's still timely yeah whatever you can vape <laughs> yeah yeah fruit loops whatever vaping pussy well, i appreciate it guys i hope y'all have a good new year oh thank, thank you so you. much man. thank you for being here we can all just hope for restaurant you know jr would call it restaurant quality pussy you know what i mean <laughs> like sometimes you just need to throw it back to the original put the fruit loops and the vape and everything aside and just remind yourself how your grandpapa used to do and just get that pussy flavored pussy you know what i mean you know and and our lauren who's on she specifically <laughs> enjoyed that so thank you for sharing <laughs> of course i heard her eyes were rolling in the back uh, of her head as you delivered it so we're all here for a reason and nobody's to be judged all right. Mind of the Meanie, I believe this is Jane, James Sorensen. James, you have a question. Mind of the Meanie top fan, by the way. That's his Yeah, he is. Oh. Hey, James. 
What up? Hi, guys. Uh, I won't take too much time because obviously I talk to you guys more than you guys put me over more than I <laughs> deserve. But, um, oh. well, ECW's 2005 One Night Stand, would that be a topic that I know we're talking ECW way back in like 90, 90, 90s to like 2001, but will two, 2005's One Night Stand be a topic? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, that would that was the like that was the perfect love letter to the fans who had ECW ripped away from them. You know, ECW just ceased to be in Arkansas of all places when they were just in the ECW arena the week before. They could have just ended the show at that last ECW arena show. Uh, but uh yeah, it just it ended so suddenly that you know, one night stand, you know, was the perfect love letter. So yeah, oh my god, yeah. The only thing I might be a little bit green on, you know, as far as topic wise, is the uh, TNN era. Uh, I mean, I was there for it, but I was there at the very. I've got some bad news for you, because <laughs> I think that was like the runner-up that lost by like one. Oh, I was there for it, but like yeah. you know, Joel, Joel could take up the uh, the front part, the front-loaded part of the uh, years, and I, you know, I can you know catch up with them on the uh, tail end. But uh, yeah, yeah, we could do. Anything's anything but WWE CW. So, yeah. Meanie, were you at were you at the 2006 one night stand? No, uh, I I had like speaking of my lung surgery, I just had my lung surgery, and they were I was considered to come in, but when they found out I had lung surgery, I got X need. So that was nice, huh? I, I wasn't either, and I was going to say, Mayday, I'll, but, I'll, I'll pick up some of the heavy lifting on the TNN days, but if we do the 2006 one-night stand, I'm going to grab a sandwich, maybe call out, take that week off. And... <laughs> we're going to bring, uh, yeah, I think we'll do, we're going to bring Colin Delaney on for uh, nice. to do the WWE CW. Extremely cute. Awesome. Yeah. I smell Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for answering my question. Lauren, ex be expecting something in the mail eventually. You know, severed head. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Is that a, a promise, a threat? Uh, <laughs> that sounds exciting and scary both at uh, the same time. Brett, me with your time. Happy New Year, Lauren. <laughs> Happy, Lauren. <laughs> Happy New Year, guys. Camp, uh, Happy New Year. Hey, which shirt are you wearing? Here, brother. Yeah. I got the, I got the, the thing finally showed up. Oh, did it really? Yes. Well, yeah, James you. ordered some stuff from our Patreon exclusive group, and it was like two things showed up quicker than I've ever seen anything show up. And one took forever. Cause that's apparently what's going on these days with the post office. So yeah, but thank you. Thanks for all your support all the time, man. Appreciate You're definitely it. the man, man. Thank you. Love you guys. All right. love, love every shows and mind of the meaning. All right. There Me you go. The ultimate plug, both shows. <laughs> Let's go to Michael amend Michael. You're on uh, with the boys here. Hey guys. How are y'all? What's up, buddy? Hey, how you hey. doing? I'm good. Uh, I really enjoyed the podcast. Uh, you all work you. really well together. It was highly entertaining. Watched it Thank on you. video this afternoon. It was, it was really good. Um, part of the reason why I'm a top guy is to watch and, and see things that I've never really been able to see. And when I was a kid, I didn't have access to ECW. And so the first ECW pay-per-view I saw a couple months ago was Hardcore Heaven 90, or no, I'm sorry, Wrestlepalooza 98. And it was so entertaining. Meanie, it was unbelievable, that opening match and Thank the you. whole thing. And then um, I also watched some ECW TV from 97. Uh, Joel, your promos are just fantastic. So I look Thank forward you. to listening to more episodes and, and uh, learning more about ECW. But my question is, is and I guess from each of you, Shane Douglas was obviously towards the top of the card in ECW. Do you think he would have had a better chance of getting into WWE in the early 2000s if he had stayed in ECW rather than going to WCW? Hmm. Uh, I don't, that's a good question. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if he would went to, I mean, could you run that by me one more time? I just had a, this, my brain just went. So he was obviously towards the top of the card in right, ECW right. world champion for a long time. 
Um, and then when he went to WCW, you know, the, the radicals left and left him behind. Yeah. And it was pro- may have been just bad creative in WCW, but if he would have just stayed in ECW, do you think that, you know, when ECW and WCW fold up in early 2000, do you think he would have had a better shot of, of getting a better push in WWF? I think WCW was probably the best route because uh, if I'm being honest, I think Shane had built up uh, some heat between he and the WWE with the the promos and how he left and, you know, burying everybody on the way out from the click to everybody. So I don't, and, but then again, you know, WWE's brought back, you know, as, as long as you can make money for them, they'll bring you back. But I think at that point he might have had a little bit too much heat with the office, with you know, just burying everybody and not, stuff like that. So I think WCW was probably the best option. Not to, and Joel's gonna have probably a much better answer than me. But um, you know, I I, I kind of like Michael what you're saying there because his stock maybe would have been higher because when WWE is looking for their invasion angle and they have really no stars from WCW and they've got some stars from ECW, but a lot of them, a lot of their biggest stars, they're pulling from their own roster because they had already gone to WWE. So yeah, in a, in a situation like that, I could see, and this is just me as a, you know, as a fan looking at it, I could definitely have seen ECW world champion franchise, Shane Douglas being someone where they said, you know, to, quote their it's best for business and say well let's bring him in at least short-term deal bring him in for this because he's kind of the face of ecw had he stayed there maybe he would have been um i think that's a really interesting idea so i just wanted to throw that in there but joel what do you think um i agree with a lot of what you and meanie both said and i don't know that i can really throw anything more of value into it because i think I'm not close enough to his personal, you know, there's, you know, did, did they want him on a personal level? Did they want him on a business level? There's so many different things to look at that without me either being Shane himself or being close enough to his situation. um, There's a lot more that goes into it than just where he's at at any given time and for how long. So it's at the same time, a completely valid and interesting question but it's one that I don't know that any of the three of us are really equipped to give you a best answer to. Well, I appreciate your responses. It's, it's a interesting, uh, I, lo- I love, question. Shane. I love Shane too, but, yeah. uh, mm. I mean, they didn't even bring, they didn't bring him to one night stand. So it's because due to the, you know, the past heat and stuff like that. And they did, did Harker home coming two nights before they kind of counteract it, you know, and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, it was a good, good question. Very thoughtful question. I just, uh, that's where I want. That's what, that's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> no problem. I appreciate you all. I look forward to future episodes. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Oh, thanks, man. Thank thanks you. for being here. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. Let's move it over to Ryan. Ryan, you have a question for the guys. Yes. Thank you guys. This is my first time here. Mine too. Uh, my question to yeah uh to, to me and gertner is uh who going into 97 into barely legal uh who do you think was the most over uh wrestler hmm probably it would to me other, it than, would, other than you meanie other than you yeah well yeah of course <laughs> uh it would probably have to be sabu i would think uh yeah. the the fact that they you know build up that whole pay-per-view with him and taz on the poster you know, they, they weren't even like the main event, but they were on the poster and the t-shirt and all that good stuff. I would have to say Sabu, in my opinion, uh, as far as it's definitely as, as far as singles go. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that whole buildup, you know, that whole year long buildup to that pay-per-view and Taz calling them out and Sabu not coming out. But when Sabu did come out, the reaction was nuclear. You know, there's plenty of, uh, you know, pull parts we did where, you know, it has a Sabu or in the ring together, the lights go out and then like 
we all hit the ring and we're pulling them apart and they're trying to get at each other in the crowd which just TV really did know justice to how electric that I thought of them almost touching, you know, before the pay-per-view. So in my opinion, and you know, now I'm a big Sabu market as it is, but I think he was going into 97 and going to that pay-per-view. I think it was Sabu. Yeah. Um, for sure. Arguably Sabu. I think Sabu, uh, I think an interesting answer for that pay-per-view might be dreamer. Dreamer was always unbelievably over, yeah. um, but would be an interesting response for that pay-per-view. Um, as far as up and coming wrestler with most promise wrestler on the move, but he had just kind of showed up within the recent months and he was still kind of on the undercard, but a guy who had nuclear heat on that show was Rob Van Dam. Um, but probably Sabu's a good answer. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Hey, uh, by the way, Ryan, welcome. You said this is your first event that you've been to. We're excited to have you on ad free shows, man. So thank you so much for uh, spending your new year's day with us and welcome uh, to ad free shows. All right, let's go. We, I believe we have six more questions guys on the docket. If that works for you, is that, is that good for you guys? I, I'm here for it. All, All right. <laughs> awesome. All right. Nick Mills, Nick, you're on with the meanie Chernoff and Joe Gertner. Evening guys. Happy new year. Hey, hey buddy, how you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, there's been a couple of ECW documentaries that have come out over the years. You've got the WWE one, uh, Barbed Wire City, um, the other one that was done by Jeremy Borash. What do you think is the best documentary that represents ECW and has the most content? Uh, that's for me. That's hard to say, just because. Uh, the, the, the true sign of any good documentary is like, uh, you know, showing all different sides. And I think somebody on YouTube went together. Somebody on YouTube did like a mega met mix and took the WWE one, put it with the Borash one and the Bob wire city one and made this like huge. Wow. Back, it's out That's there. Awesome. Uh, but like, you know, WWE's, you know, uh, rise of fall ECW, which I love. That's from Paul's perspective. And then, you know, uh, Jeremy Borash is forever hardcore. That's from a, a, a different, you know, perspective where, you know, Paul might not be seen in the best of lights. I like Bob R city too, because there's some stories that were never, weren't covered in forever hardcore. And, you know, uh, uh, rise and fall, rise and fall. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. CT brother. Um, Thanks. but, uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah. And, and you get a lot of the stuff from the journalists in Bob War city, you know, and, uh, opposing viewpoints, whether it's, you know, Wade Keller, you get Meltzer, uh, you get Mike Johnson, you get all these different aspects and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, if to me, they're, they're perfect trilogy. They're uh, companion pieces, so to speak. Uh, I can't, I couldn't pick one over the other. Uh, I have a little bit of kinship to Barbar city because, uh, I love the story of what went into making that documentary. Uh, that documentary took 12 to 13 years to be made. Uh, they started making their, they started making that documentary first. And then one day, once they started doing rise of fall and then Borash started doing his, they saw a lot of their own shot. They had the sex, exact same shots of like Todd Gordon in his office in their documentary. They're like, what have we been spending? What, what have we been doing all this time making this documentary? And these two, do two companies just beat this to the punch. Mm -hmm. But it took those ECW reunion shows, uh, Extreme Rise and Extreme Reunion, to like relight their fire. And they did the uh, GoFundMe, which I tried to rally behind and help get that that funded and. Uh, not that I was the main person, the main reason, but I tried to help raise awareness for it and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I love all those documentaries, but, uh, you know, but I just rewatched watch, rewatched Bob Wire city not too long ago. And, um, uh, there's a moment towards the end where they, it's like a silent, it's not an obvious, but it's a, a subtle in memoriam 
for all the, the the boys who had passed up until that point and just to see him you know but you know you know shot after shot after shot after shot if you're paying attention to it i get a little uh a little sappy <laughs> but every single one of those is perfect yeah um my list is about the same uh those are i think the ones that that cover everything um, the best and the most, and thank goodness they're all out there to complement each other. Um, for further reading, there's also the ECW Rise and Fall book. Mm-hmm. Um, not a documentary, but uh, make sure you've seen The Wrestler uh, just to see about different aspects about what it's like when you're an indie wrestler um, and you're doing other things as well and you're living the dream. Um Rob Van Dam has a documentary that's not completely about it's I'm not I won't even Rob Van Dam has a documentary and if you're into wrestling documentaries and especially if you're a fan of his and if you happen just to be unaware that he's got one out there he does I believe it's called Headstrong yes uh, look for that but um but yeah that's that's my list too Sorry if I stole uh, your thunder <laughs> Nick, anything else for the guys? Oh, no, I was just going to say to show off about his. Oh, uh, I mean, honestly, the, I, I'd say the same thing. The first one that I saw was the rise and fall of ECW. Um, and uh, I, to me, it was, it's just always, I had the opportunity to um, be backstage a few times during ECW. So it was like, it, I, I had always been interested in, in the behind the scenes wrestling. Like I think, literally every single person on this call right now is that's why we're all here. Um, but I was, but I had had, it was the only, uh, promotion that I had felt like I had the tiniest little taste of it because I got to be backstage a few times. And so to see that and to learn more about it was just so cool because I could kind of picture some of the people behind the scenes as much as I was able to see as much as, you know, was opened up to me. So, um, when I saw that one, and then I think I, I don't remember which one I saw next. Uh, it may have been Barbed Wire City, but um, I agree with with Meanie and Joel that it, it's just the idea of them as a companion piece. I feel like watch all three, you're gonna get you're gonna get a much larger story, and then of course watch that was extreme on ad free shows, and you're gonna get you know that's that's the ultimate companion piece, I think. <laughs> all right, thanks guys, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Josh with a nice tie in there to the ad free show piece. Well done. I got a lot of nice tie in here. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's move along here. Travis T Rob, you have a question for the guys. Yeah. I enjoyed listening to the show today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you, you guys are so nice to each other. You don't even seem like wrestlers. Oh, don't it, was on, it was, it was only wrestling. the first episode. Yeah. yeah. Well, not you, the two wrestlers. Um, I'm not nearly this nice to Chernoff when the camera isn't on. <laughs> I'm a real asshole to Chernoff. Yeah. He'll never admit it, but I, I, no, he's a sweetheart. Seems like a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> Possible. <laughs> All right. My question is for Blue Meanie. Yeah. You had a lot of insight on what was going on behind the scenes. Did you work with the Booker or were you just hanging around at the right spot at the right time? Seemed like you had a lot of answers to a lot of questions. Um, I'm asking if you were a stooge. Yeah. (laughs) Stooge brother. Um, I, uh, I am what you call a voyeur. Uh, and that sounds perverted. And I was going to say, I didn't think they were that kind of question. Yeah. I, well, no, uh, (laughs) uh, but like, I like to, sit in the back of a room and just watch people who don't know they're being watched. Like I could go to a mall and just people watch. So anytime I'm in the locker room, you know, people are like, Oh, meaning so quiet. No, I'm, I'm taking in the room. I'm sitting like, you know, you go to a, the East Side arena. We, we, we'd always sit in the same spot, you know, and I'd sit there and sometimes I'd sit there and watch Paul go over a show or I watch so by so yeah, I watched two guys going over their match and just, I have ways of entertaining myself and then, you know, and and it also goes through the years of just having conversations with people and car rides and stuff like that. And, 
you know, talk, you know, go back to the, the bar after the show and have a post show, a post show brewski and talk about everything we did that night and always talk and stuff like that. So, and for whatever reason, people seem to just open up to me, <laughs> whether they should or not, you know, maybe I'm just that good of a listener to where I'd like give people enough rope to hang themselves or whatever, but people just want to blurt stuff out to me. And I'm just like, maybe you should be telling me that. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I got a lot of insights just from sitting around, uh, the locker room observing, you know, because I was always told, you know, dude, when I went to ECW, I was only a year and a half into the business. Uh, so I was still a greenhorn and, uh, I was always taught by Al, you know, mouth closed, ears open. And, uh, I was blessed, uh, to be, you know, married to Raven and, you know, being able to, you know, listen to his philosophy and listen to him piece a match together. And then, uh, you know, stuff like that. And when I wasn't listening to him put a match together, I would watch other people put their matches together and then sit at the monitor and just listen to guys talk. And, you know, somebody might have something to say about somebody that that person doesn't know that they have that opinion and just, you know, different stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm a, I'm a, a part of the pun, but I'm definitely an, an observer when it, when it, when it comes to my surroundings you know, I, I, you know, I was always the kid in the back of the classroom because I didn't want anybody looking at my back. I wanted to survey the room, you know, read, read the room. The wrestling well, observer yeah. keeps you from getting jumped too. Yeah. In my stonewashed jeans. Oh, hey, now things hey. are coming back. I wish I'd have kept some of mine. <laughs> oh, we, there, there's a dude up in uh, Northern California has a, a trunk full. Ah! Silence. <laughs> hey, me, Polly. Is that it? All right, no yeah, problem. Thanks, Make sure you got it all in. Yes, sir. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, thanks, T. Rob. Hey, you know what? While you were talking about that, Meanie, I just couldn't help but think about we did a book club with Bill Apter and his story on how you and you and Bill met. <laughs> yes, such a great story and how he positioned it in his book and then how you would go on. I really enjoyed that. I've been called the, uh, the Forrest Gump of professional wrestling. <laughs> I've just been there for a lot of interesting things and the whole meeting bill after and this becoming friends for life on a chance opportunity. I was going to a mall as a teenager to get my stonewashed jean jacket airbrushed with the Van Halen logo and just saw bill after and that launched the friendship that wound up becoming a chapter in the book. So mm. that's a, that's a lesson to, uh, enjoy every day. You know, there you go. Look yep. for adventures. All right, let's go. Antonio Santos, uh, you were on with the guys. Go ahead. Hey, Hello. guys. How, how you doing? How you doing? How are you, hey, doing? Man, how are you? I'm doing good. Um, question for uh, Joel. I know you and the Dudley boys used to love getting that nu nuclear heat on everybody. Did you guys have to worry about your safety like every night? Because I knew Bubba just went really like he just went off on everybody. Yeah, no, we kind of just figured if we just went out there and screamed our audio memes into the microphone, we would just be okay. Uh, hey, man, you're the Dudleys, you know what I mean? So if you can't take care of yourselves, then uh, then you deserve what you get. I mean, we we called people out and on the very few occasions where they were mentally unstable or clinically unintelligent enough to take us up on it and cross that barricade. Now they've got to deal. I mean, they already were going to have to deal with Bubba and Devon. Now they've got to deal with big Dick, big Dick's <laughs> been on the inside. Big Dick doesn't care. You know what I mean? Big Dick doesn't want to go away, but big Dick's going to do what he has to do. You've also got Atlas security. They're not getting paid just to be, you know, nice guys and hang out and chill out and keep the water cooler warm. You know what I mean? Like they're there to protect extreme wrestlers which means they've essentially got their lives on the line um because again how infrequently is somebody going to stick their head in the lion's cage and actually take their lives into their own hands and it only happened a few times but boy were they memorable um <laughs> that national guard armory in willow grove or wherever in pennsylvania that was memorable um staten island was memorable um 
that Dayton crowd was unruly. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there were a few of them, man. I know I'm leaving one or two out, but um, no, we we just went out there and and were the Dudleys and hoped that um, that God was a Dudley fan. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. And is there any other like funny backstage stories you could guys could share with us? Oh my god. I just remember the one time I guess you know Sabu was ahead of ahead of his time with the uh, traveling to Winnebago. Now now when you see all the WWE guys getting tour buses and stuff like that. But he had his Winnebago out back and uh uh i think chris and tammy were using it or somewhere oh no i'm sorry i'm getting my stories confused uh chris and tammy were leaving the sub arena and uh the sub arena was a, a mummers uh mummers brigade hall where they would just do stuff for parade floats and stuff like that but on the side of the building there's like a staircase and there's a, a, a club you know like a like a social club or whatever they would have you know their own bar and the mummers get together so one of the mummers said something to chris or chris or tammy and you know of course tammy said something back and a couple of the mummers jumped on chris and uh chris's younger brother johnny was there runs into the locker room going you know chris is getting beat up you know and the locker room just cleared and you you run out there you need to see Big Dick Dudley just mowing guys down, just like, just windmilling, and just like, it was like a fucking Godzilla movie. Just he was taking people down, and fucking Two Cold Scorpio was just fucking people up left and right, and just, just like we always had those moments where like it was, our, ECW was one part slap shot, one part major league, one part Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, and it was all thrown together as every stereotypical movie you would think about a crazy sports movie or whatever. And plenty of parts, spinal tap as well. Uh, but yeah, just, you know, whatever was where we did in the ring to each other or somebody on the outside stepped in, we all banded together and stuff like that. You brought, you know, Joel brought up the Plymouth meeting riot, which was on mischief night and, uh, yep. Uh, we get, we had just lost Lulu temple because Lulu temple got sold. So we needed a new, a new building in Plymouth meeting. So, so we went to that and, uh, some frat boy college guys wanted to try hands on the axle on <laughs> you have the Dudleys in the ring. You have new Jack and, uh, the, the gangs is in the ring, oh the eliminators in the ring. And these guys throw hands on axle, all hell breaks loose. And, uh, the, 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 the SWAT team gets called in. Yeah, there's a riot at the National Guard National Guard Army on mischief night. So, and then next morning we're driving to Queens. I'm in the car with uh, Louis Dangerously and Jim Molino, and we were listening to the local news station KYW News Radio. And it's like do 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 do. Yeah, uh, riot breaks out on local, and we made the news the next day. We're just ah, we're just awesome. like laughing. It's like breaking news. And, uh, <laughs> Meaning, I keep picturing where the mummers in their full. No, uh, don't even tell me. I just no. I'm gonna picture it that the mummers. Does everybody know? I know not everybody here, or I don't know if anyone's from the Philadelphia area. Do you know what mummers look like when they're in full gear? You should Google it and then picture that it's fighting like the ECW Gras. locker room. Yeah, it's like Mardi Gras, like a bit, you know. Um, just see if, if, feathers flying everywhere. If know? anybody knows who uh, who's animating those uh, short stories of Swaggle, maybe get them on an ECW uh, fighting with uh, Mummers. Oh my God, that'd be fucking great. Whoever does, I don't know. If, if anybody knows, knows who that is, if right. anyone knows who that guy is, yeah. Uh, hey, you're, <laughs> you're talking about unruly crowds. Were you guys there? Was it in Florida where the the crowd stormed the ring and were jumping up and down and it collapsed? That famous scene that we. See where they collapsed the ring, all the fans oh, I rushed wasn't in. in yet. I think that was like three months before I started. That was the summer of '95, I think. Yeah, that was before my time too. But that was yeah. like a good. That was like a good riot, right? Like that was everybody oh, that was, was happy that, and excited. Yeah, that was the public enemy calling out and everybody in the ring and just yeah. like, hey, let's have a party. And this the ring is. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was a good time, except for the ones who had to clean it up afterwards. I expect that might have been Malenko's ring too, because that was <laughs> a, that was in Florida, and I think you know Malenko was renting the ring for that one. So, all yeah, right, let's thank, get back. Thank you guys. Get, thank yeah, you. thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Great questions, buddy. Thanks for hanging with us. All right, let's get over to RJ. RJ, you had a follow up question. Sweet. Yeah, I uh, I remembered something after I asked my question to start. Um, I was actually, my first ECW event was uh, November to remember 99 in Buffalo at the Flickinger Center. Great city, great building. Um, yeah, it's phenomenal. My wife actually swam at that in high school, but that's not my question. So, um, <laughs> um, so the heavyweight title is on the line between uh, Masato Tanaka and Mike Awesome. You know, two of the bigger, biggest guys in the business at that time. Who on that roster, um, you know, that, you know, didn't get a lot of clout in the heavyweight uh, realm of it deserved or you thought that deserved a shot at that title? And that's for all three of you. Uh, Specifically the 99? No, I just in general, like, like oh, okay. for, for instance, like I went to that show, I was looking forward to, I was been always been a big, uh, Jerry, Jerry, uh, Flynn fan and Jerry Flynn or Jerry Lynn or Jerry Lynn. Excuse me. Yeah. My mom. I don't know if there are any Jerry Flynn fans. <laughs> Thunderfoot. <laughs> you, would, you would have been the first one. Uh, the, the Flynn fans are the same thing as the sure enough fans. Hey, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, where's my fan from earlier? So he is somewhere. All right. Anyways, anyways, that segue. Um, so, you know, those guys that didn't really get, you know, those title shots, the smaller guys that, you know, really deserve to get that limelight there. Um, I would have, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It, 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 the whole roster, you know, from since when you guys started until, you know, when they closed, when you guys left. I would have loved to see Mahoney get a, a run at the, the world title. Uh, given the fact that like he was legit crazy and they probably were afraid to, <laughs> but uh, I, I definitely would. I think Balls Mahoney getting a, a run, a build up and a run at the ESW world title would have been a fun run uh, just because he was such a crowd favorite. And uh, he, I mean, he was a legit shooter and uh, he could work with anybody. No, I mean, some of the matches he had with Rob and Dan were fantastic. But uh, nobody really talks about it because you know Rob Van Dam was working Jerry Lynn all the time, and everybody talks about those matches. But watch Balls Mahoney against Rob Van Dam, man. He Balls could hang with anybody, and if he had, if it looked like he had a legit shot at the world title, I think you know some of those matches would have been awesome. No pun intended. You know, talk about Mike Awesome and stuff like that. On a side note, I got to watch Vince McMahon watch. Oh, Mike Awesome and Masato de Tanaka at a uh, one night stand and just watch him sell the chair shots. Like, Oh, Oh, what? A, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. You know, if I can, somebody gets tossed over the top rope through a table. Oh Jesus. You know, <laughs> Jesus Christ. You know, just that's my favorite. Uh, Mike Awesome story. Watching Vince, watch him and Tanaka one night stand. But yeah, back to your question. Uh, Definitely Balls Mahoney. I would love I would love to have seen him get a, a shot at the world title. Joel. I like how the world title was booked. Um, looking back, you know, because looking back, it's all armchair quarterbacking and, and, and hindsight's 2020 and what all, you know, all the cliches. But really, um, could have been done a lot worse and couldn't have been done much better. Uh, not to say there weren't people that wouldn't have benefited from getting the title. Not to say that there weren't people that wouldn't have been great candidates for it, but I don't have anything right here right now that leaps off the page for me. Uh, for me, it would be Van Dam. Um, if we're not counting the WWE CW, uh, which I don't think we're ever counting. Um, Van Dam, I think, if I remember correctly, he was TV champion for a very long time and got injured. Um, and stripped of the title then and i you know wonder sometimes had he not gotten injured and then i think the injury very quickly uh kind of let you know when he then came back uh it was such a short-lived thing before he was off to wwe 
Um, I just think there was that time during his timeout as an, uh, when he was injured that maybe we would have seen him as a world champion. Um, but uh, yeah, that to me, that would just be because Van Dam. sometimes I like, think back and I think, wait a minute, was he world champion during that time? And, but he wasn't, but I felt like he was somebody who, you know, you talk about the difference, somebody elevating the belt or the belt elevating someone, I'm sorry, championship. Um, but yeah. uh, the, you know, he's somebody who I think he took the TV title to a completely different level because he was such a must see uh, part of ECW. Um, and my only other one, if I had to say, and this is just kind of, I don't know if it would have been a big thing would have been uh, Stevie. I think, you know, cause I, I was pulling for him when I was watching barely legal. I didn't get the whole fact that it, like, it was pretty obviously we were going to see Terry funk in this big celebration. And there was some, you know, but to me, I'm just like, it's going to be Stevie. It's going to be Stevie. And I just, I don't know. I, I always saw so much more uh, potential in him than I think um, he ended up being able to have creatively. Cause I mean, he, I, I don't think it was ever for a lack of talent, um, but I don't know. I guess I kind of saw him breaking off into something bigger, more serious, especially coming out of that promo of barely legal, but that would be my answer. Well, thanks guys. Definitely digging what the three of you guys are doing. Just finished uh, the episode today and definitely you gel well together. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Let's move over to Adam from Bama. Once again, has a question. Nice. Um, I was just curious if you could just tell tell me uh, or tell us a good story about the fat chick thriller, Mr. Mike Awesome. If you had any good stories about him, maybe behind the scenes. Uh, I didn't really have too many interactions with Mike. We were on shows together all the time. Uh, nice guy, quiet guy. Uh, really wasn't, you know, you know, there's guys in the locker room that are like, the life of the party and then there's guys who are just like, you know, in, in the shadows, you know, he, he was just, he was a good guy, great, quiet guy. Uh, but, uh, personally, I don't have, I I didn't have that many interactions with him. We're worthy of a, of a ha ha story. (laughs) I got you. I'd say the same thing. Yeah, I agree. He was just so low key. Yeah. Which is, you figure that's hard for a guy who's six six and can fly like a cruiser weight and just had the most glorious mullet. I was gonna say he was a man of great mullet. Um, <laughs> that's a world class fucking mullet. Yeah, I never got to meet yeah. him. Yeah, but yeah, I wish I had more story. I wish I had a story, but I feel like I'm letting you down. Oh no, that's why it is. I just wanted to say fat chick thriller. When <laughs> that's, <I> was- <laughs> that's fair. No better time. All right. Thank you, Adam. Back to Anthony Pyres. Anthony, you're back on. Uh, Lauren, please cover your ears. Joel, you will always be the bacon in her eggs, the man for whom she begs, and the face. Well, I'll stop it right there. You guys told a million stories about uh, mass transit, but uh, that particular night took place at the awful, terrible, tremendously dilapidated wonderland greyhound park can you guys now for the for the fans and attendants like myself it was freaking awful can you please give us a little idea as to how bad it was for the boys in the back because i cannot imagine there was any creature comforts whatsoever in that crap hole that was the wonderland greyhound park and that's all i got happy new year and go packs Go Have a happy new year. Uh, happy new year. Um, happy new year. I, I guess our experience there was a little bit different because we had, we get spread out in the, in the locker room, the uh, makeshift locker room there. Uh, my experience there wasn't that bad. It was just like, you know, any other locker room. I've been in worse locker rooms than that one. Most notably, uh, was it uh, the Jim Thorpe one that literally if, <laughs> If uh, of of a board, you know, split the whole locker room could went down the side of a fucking mountain at any moment. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, the the that uh, Wonderland Dog Park. I think that was 
in the movie Goodwill Hunting. I think he, yes, he yes, it was. Her, yeah, he took her on the date there. Um, useless knowledge. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't really have any bad experiences there. I loved going. I loved the the uh, New England Loop because, uh, like, I'm sure, like Joel, I'm a creature of habit. You know, uh, I had the same rituals driving up there and same rituals driving back. You know, drive, stop at the same rest stops, go to the, eat the same places. You know, the IEBW hall was a pretty nice place, as I recall, but uh, Wonderland, oh, what a crap hole that was. The IEBW, uh, that was a great one because I like, I love the way the crowd just went up. Mm. It was kind of like a, it was kind of like an ACDC video or something, you know, for Thunderstruck or something like that. It was just like, I think I had that poster on my wall. Beulah had me hold a chair so yeah. she could do a Van Damme, a drop kick onto Fonzie. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that, that, but the Boston loop was one of my favorite loops. I loved Boston. I loved Pittsburgh and I loved the uh, Buffalo. Mm. That was always good. Yeah. Thanks, guys. L- love you so much. Mwah. Ah, love you back. Thanks, man. I didn't drive. So, um, I don't know how I got to some, I, I, if I couldn't get a ride, it was honestly, it was dealer's choice. It was like, I got to the show on angels wings. It was really, there were times where I had no idea how I was going to get to a show. I probably walked (laughs) to a show, but, um, so for one time for Revere, I'm in suburban Philly. I'm not even in Philly. Like I'm where you've got to find a 45 minute way and drop a decent amount of coin just to get to Philly. So I'm in suburban Philly. I've got to get to Revere. So let's call that suburban Boston. I think I've got it all timed out right. I've got my train fare. I got my bus fare. I got everything I need. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take, once I get to Boston, I'm taking the orange line to the blue line, to the red line, to the green line. It was a mess. And there was one Revere show where I arrived at the show at 11 p.m. (laughs) <laughs> and there's an escalator that goes up and there's an escalator that goes down. Yep. And I'm taking the up escalator and I'm wheeling my wheelie bag so that I can get into the locker room and start getting changed. I knew it was 11 o'clock, but I mean, you got to do what you got to do. And I'm going up the up escalator and the show's over. And here come all the fans coming <laughs> down the down escalator. Hey, Gertner, how come you weren't on the show? <clears throat> Aside from that, it was a great place. If you like changing in a locker room yeah. where you watch all of the dogs chase each other by the ass as a mechanical rabbit spins around while an 87-year-old man over the intercom is yelling, and there goes Swifty. That's what I was hoping to hear. That's what I was hoping to hear, Joel. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Anthony. <laughs> Meanie's just so nice. Like, oh, it's not a bad place, you know. You can make it. Oh, we've had kind of make it like home. Oh, we've had some shit holes. It's just <laughs> that's never. I don't know. What about when we got changed in the strip club, dude? In Connecticut, New Britain, Connecticut, yeah, Molly Malone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the Sting, and right, we were right. next door in Molly Malone's in the strip club. Now, if you take your clothes off in the strip club, next to us getting lap dances, and where they're changing. Yeah, yeah. Are I've been you there. technically stripping. Yeah. We were technically stripping while the strippers were dancing next to us. I yeah. think that makes us for the day strippers. Yeah. Like on my taxes, I probably like occupation. I probably had to put blah, 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 blah. And seventh one down was probably male exotic dancer. <laughs> between, between that and my premium wear ad, I think I killed so many erections. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, right. guys, so much. I appreciate you so much more than you'll ever know. Oh, thank you. Good stuff, Anthony. All right, last last question, guys. This is it. Yeah. Go ahead, meaning you're going to say something. No, I, I took off my shirt and it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Last question coming in. This is from Josh Chernoff's other fan. That's what his name now is here, and it's James Sorensen. James, what do you got? Um. Yeah, J- Josh, you have another fan too. Like, can oh. I be Thanks, James. But um. My serious question though, like Meany and and Joel, did you have a favorite besides that strip club in Connecticut? Uh, but was there a favorite arena that you guys enjoyed besides the ECW arena? 
that you traveled to? You can go first, Joel. I was a big mark for whenever we would turn a WWF or WCW building over to us. So, like, I loved being at Hara Arena. I loved being at the Cobb County in Marietta. Um, gosh. What was the I place in Poughkeepsie? When we got, what? Mid Hudson yeah. and Poughkeepsie. Yeah. Um, Allentown, Hamburg. We did all of the Vince TV buildings from the 80s. Yeah. I loved Poughkeepsie. Uh, downstairs was beautiful. It was actually laid out like, not even like a locker room, but like a dressing room for, ta- you know, you could see concert, which is weird because it's really just kind of a 2200 seat hockey rink for the local community. But the downstairs was laid out really nicely. Come to find out one time we were there, lo and behold, a few days before we were there, Marilyn Manson was there and destroyed a portion of the dressing room. So they kind of had, you know, washed tape up and whatever and apologized to us that uh, that they had to now go ahead and charge Marilyn Manson 10 grand for damages or whatever. Yeah. But uh, we had stuff like that happen all the time. We did the Tabernacle in Atlanta, which is now like House of Blues, I think. Dude. We were there the day after Megadeth. Yeah. We never had our stuff catered. No. But, but I know that Mega sh- Megadeth their shit gets catered because when we showed up the day after Megadeth and on the door, it still said Megadeth and you walk into what is the because Megadeth is on the door. So you walk in and all of a sudden you see like three paper plates, <laughs> see like three ends of a loaf of bread. And you're figuring like, how does one loaf of bread have three ends? <laughs> like, you know, like a quarter of a pitcher of like what was once 36 hours ago, ice water. And that's like, for us, that was like the dream incarnate. You know what I mean? That was like, that was like buffet all day, every day, all the way, you know, but we got, um, we got, to do the, we got to do the building where they filmed slap shot Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Yeah. 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 So yeah. we got, we were like, Oh, let's go look for the offices and shit like that. And uh, when we, we got did, to do cool buildings yeah. with creepy ghost stories behind them. Like oh cool God. rock and roll history buildings like the Agora in Cleveland. And a lot of the current WWE roster who's from the area, they all used to go to shows there. Like Miz and, and a bu- Ziggler, I think, and a bunch of guys from like Ohio always used to hit up Agora. That was kind of out there, their version of like the Elks Lodge or the arena or whatever. We did what we could make that a real loyal spot. But they had like all sorts of rock and roll ghost stories and Hollywood ghost stories. My favorite thing about the Agora is that's where Van Halen uh, kicked off their first uh, world tour of on Van Halen one open up for journey and in, wow. in Matros. Wow. So if you read the book, they're like, yeah, it was still Agora theater. I was like, oh, I wrestled there. There yeah. are people who claim that a DJ Murray, the K I think the first time the term rock and roll was ever uttered was uttered in that building. Like we, we did a lot of cool buildings there's that ghost story where and i swear to god this i heard the story many times and, and uh and we ecw was at a street i was is before i was there but i heard the story you know a couple times and it involved sammy so of course he doesn't remember it uh but like sammy was go- had to do a run-in uh but he had to come in from or his entrance from another part of the building where he comes through the crowd or whatever and somebody's like he's like yo how do i get it to this spot or whatever they're like okay go upstairs walk by say hello to so and so and keep going and you know so he goes up walks by there's a lady there hi he says hi to so and so keeps going blah 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 and uh the person later he said, say hi to so and so goes yeah why what's that all about oh that was that was a, a ghost that was our uh old house mother that used to work at the uh, strip club you know she was the house mom for the strippers but she haunted the building and if you had walked down the <laughs> hall, you had to say hi to her and stuff like that. And wow. uh, yeah, <laughs> wow. of course, Sammy does remember. Cause you know, he sees triple everything and doubles and everything. <laughs> yeah. Spe- speaking of run-ins, could we possibly get a Mrs. Meany run-in on this oh, little she- zoom chat? <laughs> Uh, she's uh, she's playing her webkins downstairs. So. Yeah, she's contractually obligated to only do that on the Mind of the Meanie yeah. podcast. Yeah. You can catch every in your lane, Sorensen. 
I try not to. Hey, I uh, I just want to say I mentioned Poughkeepsie because I was thinking about it. That's actually that's actually where I met uh, Joel um, at uh, Hardcore Heaven '99. Wow. Um, and I was with uh, with Bill Apter, the George Napolitano of wrestling photographers, <laughs> and uh, I was ba- I was helping Bill. You're riding um, his comb over. What's that? You're riding his comb over. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was braiding it on the way there. Um, no, and, uh, I was helping bill, you know, carry his bags and all that. And that's one of the, the shows I was backstage at ECW. That's how I was, I mentioned earlier being backstage was always ah. going and helping bill after. And I ran into you in a, uh, in the stairwell and we took a picture together and it was after, uh, the fire had been thrown and you were just like, yeah, if anyone asks, this picture was taken before the match. <laughs> I, was like, oh. I, I got one from Poughkeepsie. Backland was in with us. It was, it was the, I, he was only in with us for like one or two dates. It's when he was running for office and Backland was in with us and he's downstairs before the show and we're talking and, uh, and he, we're just talking and he's like, what a great building for TV. Huh? And I'm like, I'm, cause I'm a WW Mark. You know, I'm, I'm like, I can't believe I'm even talking to the guy. And he's like, what a great building for TV. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. I was like, I used to come here for TV as a fan, and I could never believe when I'd get here live that it was the size that it was, because on TV with four cameras and a crane, they make it look like a 10,000 seater, but it's actually so much smaller. He's like, yeah, it's a great building for TV. Some people would say this is the quintessential building to do TV at. (laughs) <laughs> and I had no idea whether to sell, not sell, laugh, <laughs> crawl up my own ass. Like I was befuddled. I just didn't know how to sell for it. So I don't even remember how I did. Years later, like two, three years ago, I worked a show with him in upstate New York. We did an appearance at a mall. We were both in the bathroom, washing our hands, getting ready to leave the bathroom. And I asked him about it. And I tried to kind of get an answer to whether he intentionally did that as a reference to me or not. And to this day, I still have no idea. <laughs> wow, My favorite awesome. uh, memory from Poughkeepsie is watching Scott Hall fight with a Fuji CD to try to open it so he can play a game. <laughs> he, 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 he was, he, 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 Scott Hall, everybody's seen the footage on YouTube. Scott Hall makes this surprise appearance at Poughkeepsie and he comes out to the Fuji's ready or not. And I'm just watching him like with this fucking CD trying to fucking. He's like, <laughs> I was like, you all right, Scott? This fucking this fucking thing won't sell for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Pique- I, another great building was fucking Allentown, where uh, Piper hit snook in the head with the coconut. Yeah, and then uh, Piper runs into that one ro- that room, which is a fucking bathroom. So I was like, oh, let me go look in what, what, what was in this room. You know, I'm, I'm mapping out, out all the historical places in that. But what's this room? I go in, ah, oh, I ran in the fucking bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you run in there? You, there was no, you know, it's just one way in, but theater, theater of the mind, I guess. Well, I think I, I speak for a lot, all of us. I think the last question should go to Evan Polisher who is always eccentric for ad-free shows. Polly, do you want to unmute Evan? Does Evan truly have a question? Or are you putting him on spot? Or I can ask the question. I think I saw what's going on in the chat here. And guys, two questions. All right, you ready for this? First of all, what do we have? Do you want to share what the plan is for next month, for February? Are you able to talk about that? Uh, it, I guess. Can we? I guess uh, they said it was up to you if you wanted to share. Oh, well, then, yeah, as long as we're allowed to. Right, guys? I mean, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, we haven't talked about it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, our plan is to be bringing these to you uh, the first of the month every month. So uh, we'll have another poll up, I think. I don't know okay. if we're going to do another poll or if we're just going to go with since it was only off by one for the ECW on TNN, but we might just do another poll because uh, we're hoping that more people um, will be familiar with it now as a, since it's a, a, an actual show and podcast as opposed to just 
you know, a theoretical thing that a poll was put up for. So I'm not sure what we'll do. And we'll leave that to, uh, you know, the great people that add free shows, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, our plan moving forward okay. is it's going to be the first of, uh, first of the month, um, of every first month. of the month poll driven. And mm-hmm. then the guys wanted to know, would you be willing to come back in the evening of the first when they drop for more of these as we go? If you want us, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm up to two fans at this point. So if I can get three, even out of doing these would be phenomenal. No, I a hundred percent. I, I love doing this. It's awesome to be able to, uh, to talk to everybody and, and get feedback directly. If from one everybody. of Chernoff's two fans will change their name and no longer be a fan <laughs> and we can get him back down to one. I'll do a two hour show on February 1st. Woo! <laughs> All right, so we got them. They're in. They're in to come back and join us after the the show drops once a month. So that's exciting. I'm Guys, like, again, I'm like a vampire. I only go places I'm invited. So, <laughs> all right. Well, you're definitely invited here. Cool. All right. Well, listen. That was extreme. If you haven't checked out today's episode, make sure you do. It's on Barely Legal. Guys, let's go around the horn. How can they follow you? How can they support you? And all that good stuff. We'll start with you, Blue Meanie. Uh, like uh. You said we got a, the, the Mind of the Meanie podcast, which drops every Monday, wherever you get your uh, your favorite podcasts. We also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Mind of the Meanie. Uh, if you would like to directly support me, uh, go to prowrestlingtees.com slash Blue Meanie, where you can get the uh, stylish BWO shirt, which I have in very uh, uh, a lot of different variations from uh, BWO Japan and all that good stuff. So go to prowrestlingtees.com slash Blue Meanie. If you want me to give you a uh, wish you well, go to uh, cameo.com slash Blue Meanie BWO. I did a shit ton of Christmas messages and New Year's and all that good stuff. And it's amazing some of the stuff that I get asked to do in there. So go to uh, cameo.com slash Blue Meanie BWO. All right, there you go. What about you, Stud Muffin? Where can they find and how can they support you? On Twitter, you can find me at Stud Muffin Says. On Instagram, you can find me at Quintessential Stud Muffin. On YouTube, to watch me do things like cook, scratch off lottery tickets, unbox, and auction things off, you can go to my YouTube channel. It is called Joel Gertner. Like podcasts? Like this podcast. I do a like-minded podcast that is about wrestling, but also other things like stand-up comedy. It is called the 69-Minute Eargasm. Our two most recent guests, Ken Patera. Yes, we talk about Judo Joe Black. Yes, we talk about McDonald's and Eric Young. Another podcast that I will soon be doing, and you ad-free shows people will know about it sooner than later, is the long-awaited Extreme Championship Wednesday, which is impending and wait what's that you have too much disposable income in your pocket you can find me on cameo.com for a personal message to you i don't know why you would want one to you because i'm giving one for free now or to somebody that you love or like or hate or despise you can also adorn yourself in my sartorial splendor garb and gears at pro wrestling tees.com find my page i love you all even if you don't spend money on me i want you to have a happy and blessed healthy new year wow just another that. just another talented <laughs> promo speaking of talent <laughs> the talented fred Chernoff's brother Joe, uh, here you go, Josh. This is your plug. Plug yourself here. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, Fred Chernoff, uh, who did the short stories with Swaggle. Um, there you go. Which I've seen some of the ones that haven't aired yet, and they're amazing. Uh, you can follow me at So Says Chernoff. Um, check out my show. We actually just did a uh, show last night. Um, it's called The Sherney Awards. The show is So Says Chernoff on Fight TV. Uh, drops every month. Last night was the December one. It was the second annual Sherney Awards, uh, where I gave out awards to uh, people and awful things in the uh, wrestling business. Uh, but we had a lot of fun. Um, and Joel and Meanie stopped by at the end to count down to the new year. Uh, and uh, of course, 
every Monday I am, uh, I'm with the blue meanie at the mind of the meanie, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we have a, uh, absurd amount of fun every single week doing that. Um, it has helped me to survive the apocalypse that we've been in here, uh, as meanie likes to say. Um, and, uh, oh, and while you're at it, uh, go to pressingtees.com slash mind of the meanie for any merchandise there. Pressingtees.com slash so so shirnoff if you feel like for whatever reason you need merchandise of mine. Um, and if you want uh, action figures, go to cellatoys.net uh, or uh, JB Toys on Instagram um, and you can send him a DM. We have the Mind of the Meanie two pack action figures coming out. Uh, if anyone's seen the Nick Aldis figure, um, it's, it's in that series. Uh, we're actually on the back of the box, which I didn't know was going to happen. And it's really cool. Uh, and what else did I plug? Uh, I plugged mine in the meanie, right? Yeah. You did in all my shows. I have five more shows. I'm trying, I'm trying so hard between the beard and that to be like Conrad. Um, but, uh, no, thank you all so much. Um, this has been so awesome. I I'm somewhat confused why I'm even here at times. Uh, between two ECW originals. Um, but thank you all so much. This has been a blast. Now that's awesome. And guys, that was a great plug -a mania if you will. I think we got them all covered in from toy figures to t-shirts to cameos. You can find these guys we're everywhere. Busy. What's yeah, that? We're, we're definitely busy. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're busy. Even, even at patreon.com slash mind of the media. I think we're <laughs> everywhere, you know? Um, <laughs> Yeah. So there we go. Matt, good stuff. Hey, you guys gave yeah. us an hour and 45 minutes tonight, what was planned to be 60 minutes tops. So I want to say thank you on behalf of the entire group here at Ad Free Shows. This was awesome. And really, you guys, just great answers and a lot of good dialogue with the team. So thank you so much. We're, it sounds like we're going to do this again down the road. And uh, we're looking forward to February 1st to see uh, what we get to listen to then. But appreciate you again, guys. Check it out. That was extreme. It's available now. And with that, we're going to wrap this up as the first live event in 2021 here on ad free shows, kicking it off extreme style. And you all have a good evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.